You've tuned in to Unpause Your Life with Dr. Kelly Estes. Your access to success strategies and more to help you move onward and upward with your life. Listen in each week as she interviews others who have really taken their essence to the next level and truly unpause their life. Now here's your host, Dr. Kelly Estes. Hey everyone, welcome to the show. This is Dr. Kelly Estes and I am founder of the Addictions Academy. The Addictions Coach and Rehab Rescue. Welcome to Unpause Your Life. This is a great podcast where we showcase people who have done something extraordinary with their life. I welcome you and I hope you enjoy all of our guests. On my way found a reason to wake up another day. You are listening to Unpause Your Life with Dr. Caliestis, the Addictions Coach and the Addictions Academy. I am super excited, super pumped for my guest today because he's got as much fucking energy as me. I want to welcome Marty Norman of MartyNormanLive.com. He was Indiana born and raised, not like Will Smith, you know. Spent 20 years in the chaos that's addiction in and out of prisons, jails, and hospitals. Armed with seven felonies, seven a GED and a Facebook page, he decided to turn his life of addiction into a valuable tool for reaching those who suffer the chaos and misery of addiction. He's been in recovery since July 1st, 2014. Since then, he has become a national intervention professional from the Addictions Academy, a community health worker, certified recovery specialist, owner of three successful male recovery homes, national outreach coordinator for all in behavioral health, a business owner, an entrepreneur, and he uses social media as a platform to reach hundreds of thousands a week, and I know because I have been on his show. He speaks at high schools, events, rallies, fellowships, and he is a voice for the voiceless. Welcome, Marty Norman. Hey, what's happening, yo, yo? Yo, yo, what's up in Indiana? (laughs) Is it sunny? Is it rainy? What, What goes on up there? Man, you know, I, I'm so sick of talking to Florida people and they're telling me how nice it is down there. We we just started getting some some sunny days and, and today it is raining out. I'm actually looking out the window right now. It's nasty. Were you the one who did the, the Facebook Live where you're like so excited, so excited, it's summer, it's fucking summer, it's summer, it's summer, and you open up the door and it's snowing? Dude, that's Indiana for you. Like The weather in Indiana is so fucking bipolar, it's unreal. Like, we had, like, three amazing days, like, T-shirt-type days, our first T-shirt-type days all year. And then the very next morning, I get up, and there's an inch of snow on the ground. I was so pissed. You know what? I don't have that problem. It's Miami. I can wear shorts and a tank top in January, and I can wear shorts and a tank top in July. It's amazing. Cut the shit. Absolutely. You know, we have pools on the rooftops. We sit outside 24-7 in the sun, I, at night. It's so nice. I'm so I'm so happy for you. I'm so happy <laughs> for you. It's, it's like seething sarcasm. Complete, complete sarcasm. All right, so let's talk about you. So tell me first, what is Marty Norman Live? I got the pleasure of being on the show and had a great time. How did you get into that? How did you get from... Drug addiction, what was your drug of choice into where you are now? And what was that path like? Wow. You know, it, it's the craziest thing, really, because it, it never was planned. Like, I have a lot of people who reach out to me and say, Marty, you know, I want to do what you do. How did you, how did you start doing this? I want to, I want to do this. I want to be an outreach coordinator. I want to, I want to do a live pod. I want to do a, you know, a live show. I want to, I want to help people. I want to do all these things. How did you start doing this? And I always tell them, I have no idea. <laughs> I really have no idea. This is not something that I planned out. This just started happening, I would say, about six or seven years ago. I just started posting about my recovery. I was early in recovery, and I had that fire about me. You know, I, I realized that, wow, this is a this is a brand new life, one of which I never knew anything about. And you can have fun and, and, and enjoy your life and become successful in recovery. And I had no idea about it. And so I was on fire. So I'm like, 
And of course, I'm in the anonymous programs and they're telling me about being anonymous and all these things. And I'm just like, fuck that, bro. Fuck that. I was I was not anonymous when I was on the front page of all the local papers where the U.S. Marshals were looking for me and in and out of the police blotter. Wasn't anonymous then. Why would I want to be anonymous in doing good in my life and showing people and and showing people that you can have fun and, and what is it? We're not a glum lot. So basically, I just started posting and talking about my recovery and the things that I was doing, and the, and then people started, you know, people started reaching out to me. People that knew me from my past, uh, just people that saw some of my posts, and my 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 Facebook got bigger and bigger, and people. And I started. What really started for me, and this is where it got it got really like I got serious about stuff. Is I. I was telling people how to get into treatment. I've never been to treatment, right? I've never been anywhere but a local hospital uh, on on desk bed, and then I get out and, and go to a sober living. So I was trying to help people get into hospitals, get into local and, you know, people with uh, treatment centers here in the state. Well, I would have a couple of those guys come back and be like, Marty, yo, what was that place you sent me to? You know, and they would tell me the, the the horror stories of that place. And I was like, you know what? I cannot be responsible for doing this. I, I People are reaching out by the, by the truckloads. I need to know where I'm going to send these people. So I set out to, uh, to go and, and tour these facilities in my state and, and meet the, meet the clinical staff, meet the owners, meet some of the, some of the clients, whatever. I wanted to find out what, what kind of places I was sending these people to. So basically what had happened then is like doing all this post, I had an amazing opportunity from a, from a lady we call Mama Jan. She uh, started talking to me. She lost her son from a heroin overdose the year before. So she saw my post, which this is how this works. She saw my, and this is how you can use Facebook in a positive manner. She saw my post, started talking to me about her son. I had knew her son way back in the day. And uh, long behold, she's like, uh, you know, this is how the Truman House started, too. She said, uh, Marty, you know, I got this house. I want to get out from underneath it. Uh, that's where my son grew up. I don't want to be there, et cetera, et cetera. And I want to put it. Here's the catch, Marty. I'll sell you the house, but I want you to do something for addicts. And, uh, of course, you know, I, I still got that fire in me. I'm, I jumped on it. And uh, I, I wrote the program out. I, I wrote the, the rules and regulations, the Letter of intense. I did. I wrote, wrote all this in a month because I I've been to many recovery homes and I had my guy Brian Kendrick who was fresh in recovery, fresh out of the you know detox stage of recovery, and we had both been in several. He had been in treatment and and institutions, and I had been in sober livings and fellowships. So I knew what was good in sober livings, and I knew what was bad. And I also had a vision of how we can make make it a Make it more about, okay, you're clean and sober. Awesome. Good job. I don't really give a fuck. What are we going to do with the clean and sober time? Because it's my experience, what I do with my clean and sober time, if you will, what I do with my sobriety is what's going to keep me here for the long haul. So immediately we, we jumped on the house. We opened the house up. Things started happening. Then the Facebook post got more and more. The, the shows, I started going live on Facebook. People started loving it. They were loving it because I was real and I was raw and I wasn't sugarcoat shit. And, and you know, I was just basically documenting the journey on, on what recovery should be like and could be like if you, if you just did certain things. And, and lo and behold, I, I, I got a, I got an offer. I got a job. I met a guy named James Sweezy and, uh, met him. That's a crazy story, which if you want, we could get into that. But uh, <laughs> I actually met him at a strip club. Uh, it was it was a weird thing. Hold up. You <laughs> at a strip club. Boy, that's really was, difficult for me to imagine. Let me think about that. Yeah. No, I can see that. No, I was making money. It's okay. I was, it was a hustle. Asking, wait a minute. You were stripping? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I wasn't. I wasn't. So, was, uh, so hang on, hang on, hang on. So here you are. We, we got to explore this. You're at a strip club, and he just walks in, and you guys start talking. Like you guys, you guys don't talk at strip clubs. You're not there to have a conversation. It's not a fucking coffee house. Well, you know, I would really like that to be the story, but it's not. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> it's not like we're in there drinking coffee in a strip club. Yeah, no. 
definitely wasn't that. I he was he was speaking. I, like I started saw him on Facebook, and then here I was like, this guy is like, holy shit. Like at the time, and you gotta think, this was six or seven years ago, maybe seven or eight years ago. Uh, you gotta, no, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. I take that back. It was five, seven, six or seven years ago. Anyway, so I'm posting, I'm doing all this talking about recovery in my life, and I'm, I didn't know there was other people out here doing this. And at the time, there wasn't. There wasn't nobody out here doing that. And I saw a guy named James Sweezy on, on somebody sent me one of his videos, and I was like, holy shit. This dude, this dude is like me set times a hundred. You know, he, he, he had been doing this for a while as well and he had a lot more followers than me and he was just spitting my language. You know, he was spitting that fire and I was like, holy shit, I gotta meet this guy. Well, come to find out he was speaking in Louisville because he's from Louisville and he was speaking down there and I was like, hell yeah, sign me up. So I went, it was, it was during this, uh, Fuck Heroin Foundation tour or whatever. I had like Bubba Sparks was, was headlining it and had a couple of speakers. Well, James was one of the speakers. So I was like, I signed up. On the way down there, I found out it was at this strip club. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, where did we go? We want to, we want to try to reach the sick. We don't go to churches, right? We go, right. We go, to the, we go to sorted places. And I think that was his mentality on it. But yeah, we met down there. And the next thing you know, I'm like, dude, this is what I've been doing. This is what I'm doing. He's like, really? All right, awesome. Let's let's you know let's connect and and we've connected and ever since then we've been a we've been a team together. As far as the show goes, I, I have a show called Monday Motivation Evening Madness, and it's on at uh it's on 8 p.m. Eastern time on at Marty Norman Live. Um, it is like we started doing lives in my car, me and Brian Kendrick. We started doing lives in my car while he was driving. We just start singing to the radio and acting crazy. And that's where that started. It was like I never set out to open a to start a show. It just kind of happened. We started doing lives. People started eating it up. We was getting thirty, forty thousand views on a silly video. And the next thing you know, I was like, dude, let's let's start doing it. We started doing it at nine a.m. And then it's progressed into what it is today. And uh, it's a good show, man. We had we had you on there. That just proves to everybody out there that it's legit. I'm just saying. Look at that shameless plug and brown nosing we at have, the same time. We have Doc, we have Dr. Callie Estes on the show. That means I'm the shit. You've had a lot of good people on there. I saw you had Phil Chalmers on there. That was a good show. We've had Phil Chalmers on there. We've had uh, Tiffany Jenkins from Juggling the Jenkins was on there. And that she, I mean, she's like hit, between her and you know, Matt Bradley from Deadliest Catch. We had Chang Sweezy. We had all the local guys. We had Yes, but did Matt write the forward to your book? No. Okay. I'm more special. <laughs> yeah. And who who wrote the forward? Matt Bradley. Yes. That's uh, I, I, it kind of hurts my feelings a little bit, but it's cool. I get it. Well, he was on Deadliest Catch. He was catching crabs <laughs> and doing heroin on the boat. Oh, like, that's pretty badass. I'm on Monday Motivation, Marty Norman Live. What the, you know? It's all right, Marty. You'll catch up. It's okay. I, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm just playing catch up. Now, see, I'm going to have a bunch of your fans hating me now. It's like, you're picking on Marty on your podcast. What happened? <laughs> you know I love no, you. to make fun of your goddamn sneakers. That's okay. Dude, 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 I know. You won't let that go. Like, I have had so I got these green, neon, no, not neon, sorry, mint green Reebok classics they're like classics they're really amazing they're mint green and dr Callie hates them and no i love them problems. that's the problem i love them <laughs> so you haven't seen my sneaker connection i have a i'm a shoe whore i have a sneaker collection that will rival your sneaker collection in every color everybody out there do me a favor hashtag sneakerheads <laughs> <laughs> because i do i mean I, it's a healthy addiction for me. Like I see something in the shoes. I, I don't know what it is about a new pair of shoes. It just makes me feel like a brand new man. You know, well, it's, but, it's almost like a shot of dope. Maybe let's know. talk about that. See, see, addiction is addiction, right? An addict is an addict. I know we don't like that word, but if you're addicted to something, you're addicted to other things. And we That's don't true. ever stop having that craving for certain things. So instead of doing drugs, we find something that's acceptable and it's good. Well, Sneakers are great. Yeah. We, we got to, if we're substituting something, we got to find what's healthy in our lives and what's unhealthy. Now, if my shoe 
addiction becomes unhealthy where I'm spending my rent money on all these $2,000 pair of shoes yes. every, every month. I might, I might want to take a look at it, but until then, I feel healthy enough. That's good. And I saw you were walking on the treadmill with your laces open. Now explain yeah. that to me. Why are you walking on the treadmill with your laces open? I like to live dangerous, Dr. Callie. I like That's to. That's pretty dangerous. I'm a, I'm a jagged edge. And a <laughs> the shoelaces were only about an inch and a quarter long, so I, I never tripped over them. So let me give our, our listeners a visual. So Marty's on the treadmill walking like a mo- like point zero zero one miles an hour, first of all, nice and slow. And he's filming his feet. And all I envisioned was this hot, blonde Barbie doll next to him, watching him walk two miles an hour, filming his feet. And then his laces get caught and he trips and falls and her laughing at him. Like that's the visual that I got. Just to give you an idea. Dr. Kelly, I guarantee you if that happened, I would have been able to pick her up. Been like, I, hey, here's my number. You like that? I got that shit all day long. <laughs> I have no, I, I have no doubt. I have no <laughs> doubt you would have been able to recover from that. <laughs> been like, yeah, I, I could do this all the time. Just stick around. Oh my God. <laughs> so tell well, we me. Gotta make I, I know. Tell me more about how you got here. So here you are. You got this badass show. You said you had seven felonies. What did you get felonies for? What did you get in trouble for? I mean, you look like a stand-up guy. You're not tattooed or anything, clean cut, you know. Are you out of your mind right now? Are we talking about <laughs> something else? <laughs> I have a face tattoo. I know. I mean, now, what possesses <laughs> somebody to do that? Like, okay, I'm going to sit down and, and get a needle in my face. Like, people run from that. What, what were you I thinking? Never- I, I never wanted to work again. That's what it, I was thinking. I wanted to be unemployable for the rest of my life. <laughs> so I'm going to find a hot chick that's going to take care of me that likes face tattoos so I don't ever have to work. That was your theory? Uh, absolutely. Ain't that the American dream? How'd that work out for you? Eh, not so well. Not so well. <laughs> um, yeah, not so well. I am covered in tattoos. I do have a face tattoo. Um, you know, the seven felonies thing is... You know, I, I probably should have, you know, I committed a felony every single day, all day long in my life. So I'm, I feel lucky to only have seven, actually. I have uh, four DUIs, driving on suspended, driving on HTVs, felony possessions, fleeing, running from cops, uh, high-speed pursuits. Uh, all of it is revolved around drinking and drugging. Well, mainly because there was not a, a sober day in my life, it, uh, you know, it, for 20 plus years, I lived in the chaos and madness that is a, that is addiction, you know, and I actually grew up in addiction. So I, I, truth, I mean, to give myself a, you know, a little leeway here, I didn't know any different. You know, I, I didn't know any different from my parents were both uh, addicts and alcoholics. They, there was a toxic relationships always in my home. I was the kid who was embarrassed to bring kids home after school. I was, we didn't have food a lot, you know, that kind of, that household, the, the old trailer, trailer park household style. That's, that, that's me. That's how I grew up. So getting into addiction, you know, it, it was just natural. Like at first, I, I like alcohol at first for me was incredible. Like I, I read a story the other night that talked about this lady. She was in, uh, start drinking. She only drank for three years, but her life completely spun out of control in, in that three years. And she did ne- she said she never drank socially. And I was like, damn, really? Wow. Uh, Cause I remember drinking like socially was everything. This was during the nineties and everybody partied, everybody ate acid, everybody did cocaine, everybody drank and house parties and cake parties and, and you know, everybody was selling drugs and, and you know, it was just what we did, you know, and there, we never ran out of something. There was always something, but. What it ended up happening is that social drinking turned into I got older and addiction actually set in. And then I was incredibly recluse. I got into methamphetamines really bad. And I don't know if you know this, but methamphetamines is not a sociable drug. <laughs> it's not it's not a bar drug where you can just go hang out and have fun. It's not that you're, you're, you're locking yourself in a basement. You're locking yourself in a, in a garage for weeks on end. And. and Party. Oh, to God, no one else sees you. You're and on your biggest... 11. I can't imagine you on uppers. I can't. You're on 11 sober. 
<laughs> You're like me. You on know, 11 sober, on, on uppers, I am like, oh, my God, I am like too much for anybody. I can't imagine you on uppers. Dude, it's crazy, too, because, you know, there was my moments where I was just a maniac, but that's usually when I did too much, you know, at one time. And, uh, but one time, <laughs> once. <laughs> I took too big of a shot, and I was just a complete maniac. But, you know, in actuality, it it did the opposite. Like, it it calmed me down. It made me very, um, very soft spoken when I was really high. Like I could, I would be like, if I didn't have any dope for a while, my, like when I got into my later stages, like if I went a day or two without dope, my old lady would go crazy and tell me, Marty, go get a fucking bag of dope. You're driving. Cause I would just be a, a dick. I was an asshole. I was going through all those things that we go through when we, when we run out of drugs or we're withdrawing or we're, we're going through the irritable, restless and discontent stages that, that is us. And my way, and then I would go to the garage and I would take a shot and I would come back and I would be this incredibly soft spoken dude and she would, you know, everything was okay. And that, that's weird, right? No, it's actually people who have ADD and ADHD. My husband's very similar. He's actually better on cocaine than he is sober because he focuses. He's easy to talk to. You can have full conversations. When he's sober, I repeat myself 10 times. And I'm like, do you hear what I'm saying? And he'll look at me and go, what? So <laughs> when you we have. We should have a medically assisted methamphetamines. You know, <laughs> it's called Adderall. <laughs> they do have it. <laughs> um, I guess I guess it's called Adderall at that point. But, yeah. Uh, but it's interesting. It's interesting how the brain works. If you have, like, scattered brain, when you take the uppers, then anything, anything ephedra-based, cocaine-based, anything like that, you feel normal. Yeah. When you're seems- someone like me who doesn't, I mean, I have some ADD, but not like that. I am, like, insane on that kind of stuff. Like, I'll drop 50 pounds. I'm in the gym three hours a day, and I'm killing it. But then I detox, and it's horrible. The detox coming off is ugh, awful. That's the worst. I know I know detoxing off of heroin is bad. I know detoxing from alcohol is horrible. But the detox from uppers and speed of any sort is this emotional, just, I want to. I, I don't want to fucking live anymore type type stuff. It's not so much physical as it is emotional. It's, it's, it's something that I, that I refused to do for a number of years. Like I was literally on methamphetamines for almost 13 years, give or take the in and out of prisons and jails things, which get even into that. I can get into that in a minute. Prison is where I got my first heroin addiction. Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's a horrible, uh, I refused to come down. I refused to sleep. I got to the point where I told myself I didn't need to sleep. And there I was, the guy that would pass out at stoplights and have the guy behind me honk. And then I would drive to the next stoplight and pass out, all while doing incredible amounts of methamphetamines. You know, yeah. it's, your body shuts down after a while, I guess. So, but yeah, you know, and my, I think it was my fourth, third or fourth time in prison. Heroin was really big in prison. You know, it was like everywhere you go, everybody was selling heroin and heroin was so readily available that when I got in there, I was like, wow, I'm going to do all right here. So what I do, I started doing heroin. I started getting tattoos and started doing heroin. I fit right in. That's the thing about me. I I did some, I I felt I didn't do a lot. If you really want to think about it, because I know people have done 20, 30 years, but for me, I was so comfortable in a prison setting, in the structure of prison and jails. I, I, I did very well. I would work out, you know, I'd do all these things until the last time that I just spoke of, I, I got really strung out on heroin in prison, you know, and then everything just went to shit. And I was actually, I didn't want to come out of prison because I, when I went in, I didn't have any heroin. Heroin wasn't a thing. When I went into prison, everybody was doing methamphetamines and then I get into prison. And everybody there is selling heroin or doing heroin. So I was scared that if I got out, I wouldn't be able to get heroin. So I didn't even want to leave. <laughs> How crazy is that? That's the insanity of this disease. It's like, I would rather stay in prison so I can get my dope. That's well, insane. To me. It, it, when you think about the addicted brain, it's not. Think about prison. So you, you're fed. You don't have to forage for food, right? You don't need money. So you don't have to work. You can lay around and get high. 
and you have a, pl- a warm bed. You're dry and you have showers. It is a perfect yeah. setting. Three hots and a cot is what we call it. That's Don't have to worry about shit. That's all you need. And you didn't have to work for any of it. You get up, you get high, hang out. <laughs> I mean, it's a perfect setting for, for heroin use. Think about it. Absolutely. I guess now in the state of Indiana, like Suboxone is the, um, the drug that took over in prisons in, in this state anyway, because it's, I guess it's so easy to get in. Like you, you, you know, you can, and, and this is how drugs get into prison, uh, at least here. Either you got crooked guards, which is, you know, it happens a lot, or people make plugs. They go outside to work, and somebody drops the drugs off, and what, where do they put it? In their cavities. <laughs> and so, so you wait, even wait, get, hold up, hold up, Marty. Did you ever engage in this behavior? Plugging. Our no. listeners want to know. I mean, Marty and Norman <laughs> Live will never be the same after this conversation. <laughs> I actually never had outside clearance to go to, to go to work outside the fence. But, but but hold up now. That means somebody else did this yeah. for you. That means you took actually, drugs that were under somebody's rectum. I have I have smoked ass tobacco. I have done ass <laughs> ass heroin and all other drugs. It's come in from the streets into prison that was literally up somebody's asshole. Yes, I have. Marty, my opinion of you. No, I can't, I can't say that. My, I will never look at you the same now and I will never look at you without laughing. It's just, I can't, I can't. We're going to, we're going to call it asshole heroin from now on. This is, this is like a whole new level. Like there's doing heroin and then there's doing heroin that's been up some other guy's ass. Like this isn't even like vagina heroin. I mean, I could have given you that. (laughs) Your girlfriend smuggled it in. I get it. Blah, blah. But no, this is guy heroin. You know, you know what's really funny is I don't think I've ever told that story before. So I appreciate you bringing it out of me, especially on air. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Oh, oh my god, my podcast listeners are going to be like, "What in the hell? We're talking about vaginas and assholes and heroin. Yeah. Like, what is what on earth is going on over there?" My goodness, my goodness, where did where did this go? What had happened? <laughs> This is your life. We're talking about your life, Marty. This is not my life. And I used to work in a prison. I worked at SCI Rockview. So I saw everything that happened in there. It was insane. Yeah. Uh, prison life, you know, it's, it's this one stint. Um, I've been to uh, four different prisons, but this one place was the, uh, they call it the farm. It's, it's a really old prison. But, you know, when I first got there, you go into R&R, which is like, where you get it's where they figure out where to put you after that like you go through a little bit of counseling and the questions and all these things it's called r and r's where you first go and i was pretty scared because like the first week i was there you know you hear stories and you see people get pulled out in stretchers and they all these things so the first week i was there two people overdosed from heroin and died and, and two people got beat to death yeah. and i was like dang it. i was like where the hell am i you know, and the very first day that I left R and R and went to my actual dorm, uh, the very first day I met some people that I knew, you know, and the very first day I got a, a half gram of, of shard, a half gram of methamphetamines, and I was like, oh yeah, this is, uh, I, I'm gonna do all right here, you know. I saw people in prison, like, cause when you, you run up a debt in prison for money, which I, for heroin, which I did, um, I actually had, uh, some of the, cause we had cell phones in there, and that's how you get money, and, and I uh, saw people, you know, we had baby oil on a commissary list. And what people would do if you owed money and you wasn't paying or you couldn't pay or something happened, you, you would wait till you go to sleep, they would put baby oil in a bowl and put it in the microwave and get it boiling. Ooh. And, then they would dump it, and then they would dump it on your face while you was asleep. And I saw people's eye, whole eye, not eyelashes, but eyelids being melted off. Yeah. And you can't just, you can't, it's, it's oil, so you can't just run to the shower and wipe it off. You know, it's, it's done. It's burned. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty severe pain to watch these guys scream the way that they do, you know, and there's nothing that can be done. It's pretty, it's pretty intense. Absolutely. Wow. So here you are now. So Marty, what, what changed? 
here you are, you're a construction worker doing drugs, you come from a bad family situation, you're out there committing crimes, not violent crimes, but, you know, drug crimes, driving while license suspended, DUI, all the normal drug stuff. And all of a sudden, here you are running Mar- Marty Norman Live, getting people into treatment, changing their lives, doing all this amazing stuff. What turned for you? What was your aha moment? I would like to say it was one moment, but it was actually a year long process of an aha moment, if you will. I actually got into, re- I stumbled into the, I was completely the worst I've ever been. I was living in Terre Haute. I was, I was squatting in a trap house in Terre Haute, Indiana. And, um, you know, I happened to walk by this sober living home and I walked by it every morning or every couple mornings, whatever it was. And I would, cause the liquor store was just on the other side of it, which is crazy, but the liquor store is just on the other side of it. So I would walk to the liquor store because, you know, when all else failed, I have $10, I'll go get a handful of some cheap vodka or something, you know, and I would walk by this place and there'd be these people out there and they're at this outside this recovery home and they're laughing and they're smoking cigarettes and they're drinking coffee and I would just fucking hate them. I'm like, why are they, so? I'm miserable, you know, I'm, I'm going through it. I'm miserable. I've never been this bad. I'm dirty. I'm filthy. I'm living in a trap house. It's bed bug infested, broken needles, broken bottles. It's just everything you can imagine. And so I started questioning this. What, you know, I went back to the house. The guy that was there, I started asking, what the hell is this place? And he explained it all to me. And I never really heard of a recovery home. And I, I'm not even sure if I've ever heard of any fellowships or anything. Because at this point, like I said earlier, I didn't know any other life than the one I was living. You know, I didn't know that you could be the way that I am and, and change. You know, I didn't see how I couldn't see how it happened. So eventually... A few days later, I stumbled into uh, one of the meetings they had there, and I was high. I was really high. I took a shot right before I came, but I walked in, and this room, and this room lit up. It was, it was, there was light in this room. There was energy in this room. There was people in this room who were wanting to give me a hug and shake my hand and ask me what my name was. And of course, I didn't want to tell them, but you know. They were, they were like, Hey, how are you? Glad you can make it, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then I would hear them speak and they were talking about positive. They were, they were talking about positivity and things they were doing in their life. And, and they were hope shots for me. I had never seen this before. So four days later, went to a couple more of those meetings. I went up to the guy who was chairing me and I asked him, I said, what do you, how do I do this, man? I want, I want what you have. I see what, I see the light in your eyes. I want this. And, I've never seen this before. And he's like, dude, come with me. And he, that I ended up moving in that day, you know, completely strung out. I moved, I went from the streets, strung out, did dope that day to moving into the sober living, which I strongly wouldn't advise doing, but they allowed me to do it. And it, 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 you know, so thank God I stayed in that recovery home for seven months. No, I'm sorry. 11 months, completely sober, completely on fire. Right. And that's when I started posting about my stuff. I was, I was, Sharing meetings. I was going to five, six, seven meetings a week. I was, I was working. I had my job back in the construction union. I was a cement mason. I had my job back with them. They let me back in. I was getting to see my kids. I was trying to do that one, two step. You know, I admitted I was powerless. Now I got to go tell everybody I'm sorry type thing. The old one, two. And, uh, I was doing everything, feeling good. I got the band-aids on, got the shower, got the girl around the table who has like, 20 days clean, you know, that was, that was how I was doing, <laughs> that was how I was doing my recovery and, and everything was wonderful. It really seemed wonderful. And, but I didn't do everything that they, they suggested me do one thing or two things in particular. And that was Marty, get a fucking sponsor. Marty, work the steps. Let's get honest. Let's get humble. Let's do these things. And I would talk about that in meetings like, yay. Cause I did, I got me a sponsor. I said, Hey, will you be my sponsor? He said, yes. And I never called him again, you know, or, you know, and so I said, talk about the importance of sponsor. But again, I never did it. So that construction job was a seasonal job, you know, cement Mason in Indiana. I got laid off. Things happened with that girl. Things happened at home. Life happened. You know, wait, I got wait, wait, Hold up, hold up. Things happened with the girl with 20 days clean? No. Yeah, yeah. Really? You know, and I, thought I was, I was going to marry her. She was so good. We were going to sponsor each other and everything. All right. So you found, wait a minute, you found <laughs> your love of your life 20 days sober. I love those stories. Like, And you're still yes. together and you have four kids and life's amazing, right? 
Absolutely. It was going to be beautiful. It was going to be. And then what happened? Uh, well, you know, the other guy had a car, you know. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> she loved me, though. She, she just did what was best for her. Right. <laughs> yeah, so... Yeah, as you can see, in this in first time, first try and try and recovery, I didn't do what they suggested. I just stayed, I just was sober. I was, I was white and not clean sober. And, uh, life happened, as you know, as you, anybody told me it was going to. Uh, I was, you, I was, I was not prepared against that first drink. And a guy was working at the local, uh, sushi place. He walked in with a big cup of sake. And instantly I thought to myself, well, that's not heroin. And I've never tried sake, and I drank it. I was defenseless, and I took a drink of it. And the next day, I the next very very next day, I he came home with another cup. I drank it, and I sent him out to that liquor store, same liquor store, which I said was right there. And we got a couple uh, pints. We drank them. We got told on. We got kicked out. Thank God we got kicked out. You know, because I strongly, if you if you decide to relapse. Leave the sober living home that you're in because you're going to kill somebody, right? But I, I'm, I'm so sucking self, and I didn't care about anything, but, you know, I wanted to feel different. And uh, so I left. I was out there for seven months, and this is – I thought it was bad before, but this is where it really got bad. I got a, I had a head full of AA and a belly full of booze, right? So the guilt, shame, remorse, and I'm back in the streets. I'm back to eating Suboxone and drinking when I wasn't and selling – uh, bunk cocaine to pay for the other things and just living and pouncing from couch to couch. I was actually at this point sleeping outside. There was three bars in Westville, Illinois that I would frequent and I dated the bartenders and one of them opened up. She would open up at like 8 a.m. And of course, you know, the other one would close at three. So I would only had to sleep outside for a few hours and then wake up and go in there and smooth her with my wonderful, wonderful, charming personality that I had. You know, <laughs> and I would get free drinks, of course, you know, that went on for a while. I got to fight over a $50 game of pool and over pride and ego. Uh, I hit the guy once he hit the, uh, he hit the curb. He got lifelined. I got scared. I knew I was, if I stopped using things, I was going to get sick. I also knew if I didn't, I would, you know, I was scared. I was going to kill. I heard this guy might die. So I was completely scared that I had killed somebody. I was completely scared that I might do the rest of my life in prison. So I knew what to do. I ended up going to the hospital, detoxing, went back in that same sober living house and things. And then the cops came three, three days, three weeks later and picked me up. I was actually in a meeting and they come through the door four or five deep. And uh, they said, uh, basically, is Marty in here? And, and of course, everybody's like, I don't know him. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, here I am. So I ended up doing a year in the county, right? They, oh, they, wow. They, they came and got me. They put me on a really high bond. Now, I've done prison time, and I can do a year in prison. That's that's a lot easier than doing a year in a in a one room, because that's basically what it is. You're in this little room for a year. And during this time, right, I knew that there was better. I walked in this room. And there's all these 19, 20 year old kids and they're slap rapping about this and how good they got it on the streets and money and they're slap gambling on games and playing cards. And I was just over it. I was just over. I could not find any enjoyment in that. I actually hated it. So what I did, this is that aha moment that lasted a year is I locked my, I pretty much went in my room and I started reading these self help books. I started reading these fellowship books. I started studying them and taking notes and writing stuff down and underlining. I was, I was, I had to change. So I've been coming to that same jail cell for 20 plus years, right? 20 years in that same jail cell with the same fucking people. And they started, this time it was different because they, I, here I was 35, 36, 35, and they called me old school. And I thought to myself, holy shit, when did this happen? You know? They're all 18 and 19, and I'm like, damn, I used to be you guys. So that's where the change started. I got out, got had to do, I did a year in the county, had to do a year on um, house arrest, and I, as soon as I got out, I got a sponsor, started hammering out these steps. Stuff started really changing for me, and that's when 
I got into the story earlier about, you know, that's when I started posting all these things and I met Mama Jan and she, she sold me this house and then I went and met James Sweezy and Brian came into play. It just all this stuff started happening. You know, when I got out of my way a little bit, started doing what I was suggested to do, things, the doors started opening. You know, and now I, I work for, I work for All in Behavioral Health, right? I, I'm a national outreach coordinator. I, I got, I got trained by you from the Addictions Academy to be a, uh, a national interventionist. You know, it's, uh, I mean, I'm a certified recovery specialist. I own three recovery homes in Terrell, Indiana. I travel, I speak, I just all these things are happening. I got Monday motivation, the show, I got the page, you know, I mean, all these things are happening. And it's all because I finally said, you know what? I don't know shit about life. Show me how to do it. And that's where it all started. If I could ask the Marty that was walking down the street, looking at the guys laughing and giggling over coffee, if I could say to that Marty, could you imagine where you are today? What would you have told me? I would have laughed at you. I, I would have, I would have laughed at anybody who told me I could be here where I'm at today. There's abs- this was completely, I didn't get into recovery be- or get into, didn't walk into that room that day because I thought it was going to bring me this. I, I just knew that if I didn't, I was going to die. And, you know, when we, we tell ourselves, and some of us make five year plans in early recovery and we tell ourselves that these are the things I want to accomplish. I want to get, I want to get back in the union. Uh, I want to get a car and a driver's license. I would love to get back with my girl, you know, my baby mama, you know, that whole thing. That's what we say. to That's what a lot of us say to ourselves. We really sell ourselves short by by doing that because the sky, I'm a firm believer. If you can hold, see it in your head, you can hold it in your hand. And not only is recovery possible, but anything you really want to do in life, I don't give a shit where you are, how bad you got, you got seven felonies, you live in the streets, you got no family, all those things. I am, I don't care what it is. If you want it and you're willing to put in the work, you can make those things happen. I, and I know that sounds so fucking cliche, I get it, but I'm living proof of it. What I'm doing on this page is documenting that journey. So everybody else, I like to think in my head that, you know, during that 20 some years of addiction and chaos and misery and everything that came with it, that if there was somebody out here that I could, that I saw on Facebook, or I guess back then it might have been MySpace or something else. If I had saw somebody doing, you know, completely like tatted up, face tattoo, just Real and raw recovery. Saw so somebody doing what I'm doing. I'd like to think that would have been attractive to me. And maybe I would have got out a little sooner. Or maybe I would have, a seed would have been planted, you know? But when I thought about getting sober, I thought I was going to live this boring life where nothing good was going to happen. I was going to get the, you know, the white picket fist, the dog named Chef. I was going to a job I hated every day. The kids would bitch at me. The old lady would probably hate me. It's just miserable. That's what I thought of sobriety. Right. I was completely wrong, man. It is exactly what you want it to be if you're willing to put in the work. That's awesome. Yeah. So <laughs> we are out of time. Tell our oh, audience how they can find you, how they can watch this amazing show that I got the privilege of being on with your sunglasses on at night. I'm going <laughs> to. Oh, sorry. Sorry. We can have James pipe that in. In between the segments, just for you, since you wear sunglasses at night and all your photos have sunglasses on. Um, where can our fans find you? How can they connect with you? And if they need help with treatment, how do they find you? Okay. So basically I, I'm on all sorts of social media. Like social media is a platform I use to reach hundreds of thousands a week, you know, lots more a month. You know, I, I, I'm at Marty Norman live on Facebook. I'm at Marty Norman Live on Instagram, YouTube, uh, Twitter, um, you know, and if somebody needs, if you or a loved one or somebody out there needs help to get into a detox, a treatment, recovery of any sort, mental health, I don't care what it is, I have a resource all over the country, right? I work for All in Behavioral. If you go to MartyNormanLive.com and check it out, there's a little request button there, request help. You just push it. Put your name in there and we will get back to you as soon as possible, usually really quick, because uh, this is what we do, man. It's like, uh, you know, I 
I hated the fact that I hear people say all the time, though, I don't know how to get help. I, I don't know where to go. Anybody, anytime, anywhere in the country, MartyNormanLive.com, and we will get you in contact with the people who can help you. That's a fact. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on our show. We will put up all your links and your wonderful photos with your green sneakers and sunglasses. And our listeners can find you or stalk you depending on um, what they're looking for. Yeah, come on with it. I ain't scared. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Dr. Callie. I really appreciate you, you allowing me to be on your show. Thank you so much. Everybody, I love you. I'm out. You are listening to Unpause Your Life with Dr. Caliestis and Marty Norman of Marty Norman Live. Hey, everyone. Thanks again for listening. I really hope you enjoyed the show today. Head on over to iTunes and Apple Podcasts and leave a comment or review of what you think. Or contact us at 1-800-706-0318. If you want to be on our show, feel free to email or call. And if you have a topic, feel free to email or call as well. Thanks for listening to Unpause Your Life. For show notes and more, head on over to unpauseyourlife.com. Big shout out to recoveryinnovators.com for help producing this show. Thank you, guys. I took a walk down the long road Where they said that I shouldn't go On my way found a reason To wake up another day But they needed to show you All the things that you won't do Find faith or religion But nothing to show for it Down the dark road Where they said that